Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to open and uh, to say that this event is open and very thankful to, first of all, to Union for the Mediterranean for hosting uh, this event uh, uh, in, uh, on this uh, Med Pavilion. And I'm very glad uh, that we uh, put hand in hand with European Investment Bank to uh, discuss this afternoon on uh, a first very important topic on how we are going to finance and succeed the energy transition we are all looking for in the Mediterranean. So uh, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Mr. Gramenos, who will uh, open our discussion today. Gramenos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, really thank you for being here. I am pleased to welcome in the Mediterranean Pavilion, first time that we have a Mediterranean Pavilion at a COP. So distinguished speakers, among whom uh, Lapo Pistelli, who used to be my vice minister. And it's a pleasure to see him uh, uh, in this uh, occasion. Energy and the Mediterranean. Energy is a commodity, but is uh, more than a commodity. In our times, it is an enabler of development. It is fundamental for human rights, but it is also part of the equation of security and sovereignty. We live in a moment in which the Mediterranean faces a huge threat posed by climate change. Second fastest warming region of the world. Predicted consequences point towards a possible destabilization of this region, and in this energy has a part to play. Many challenges, interconnection, which is difficult. North-South, even more difficult South-South, but it's necessary again for sovereignty, protection of human rights, development. And uh, I almost did it on purpose to talk, in some, uh, mentioning some dimension, that until not so long ago, would cause uh, some allergy when we come to talk about finance. Finance was geared on the idea that a market is a market. It might have some social responsibilities, but these were considered as interferences. In the moment in which we start tackling uh, this issue, we are very, very lucky. Maybe the COP is not going so fast, but the real world is going fast. And uh, we are about to face this very important topic after something extraordinary has happened. The first extraordinary development is that dimensions of energy that were considered as reciprocal interferences are now considered elements of competitivity. A market that would consider social engagement as an inducers of costs that could lower competitivity is now realizing that actually these social precautions, these environmental precautions are boosters of, uh, per of performance. At the same time, we are entering in the real phase of this discussion with a an important evolution in the world of finance. When we think about projects for decarbonization, for stabilization, we have in mind uh, public funds because it sounds as though private capital is not really there. They have other objectives. But we start this discussion while we're witnessing the greatest portfolio shift in history. Sustainable investments, so-called ESG, at the beginning of the century were less than 1% of the global uh, managed portfolios. Today, they are above 26%, which is enormous in 20 years. We don't know how much seriously, how much for image, but the big CEOs of these portfolios declare that this percentage has to become 60% within five years. We are also witnessing a change in approach in the industrial sector. Again, the idea was I have to be competitive so I cannot really afford to integrate too many costs. 
deriving from the necessity to protect society and the environment around me. Companies have realized that if you do so, actually, it is true. You uptake some costs, but at the same time, you have so many advantages in terms of competitivity that there is no more I ideological or cultural barrier against it. Three, third great evolution that helps us is that uh, economists have realized that we don't need a happy degrowth. The European Union defined the Green Deal not a sacrifice in the name of uh, the environment, but as a plan of growth. Of course, I will not illustrate the economic background to say that there is only one hope that we can have another growth cycle, which is a green uh, transition. And I hope through this to give an encouraging uh, message uh, while we start to, f to examine uh, such an important uh, aspect. We need finance to do things. We don't need to look for finance anymore only in international banks. The economic world understood that there is no contradiction between making sound business and making our Mediterranean a much better place, resilient to climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gramenos. So before discussing how to get there, I would like to share with you as a sort of uh, set the scene, the very, very fresh findings of our Mediterranean energy perspective, which we will be launching on 17 here in COP. But I wanted to extract from this work uh, the investment needs of uh, different scenarios in the Med. And we, um, sorry. So the assessing the financing needs in a, a net zero carbon scenario. So MEP, Mediterranean Energy Perspective, this year, so we produce uh, two scenarios. The first one is uh, we present uh, demand and supply prospects up to 2050 based on in-house econometric demand-based model. In the reference scenario, we consider, we, we, we have translated what would be the impact of uh, uh, the Mediterranean countries achieving their unconditional NDCs. So achieving the unconditional NDCs is that what will happen in any case because the countries have committed themselves to do so. They are saying also that we can do much and better, which is the full NDCs, but in that case uh, they claim that they need financial support in order to go further. We have uh, developed such a scenario last time, but this time, this year, we have been contemplating what would be a net zero carbon future in the Mediterranean. And this is goes much further than the indices in full. So just to let you know that this is really very, very ambitious, but let's have a look. So this work has been uh, performed thanks to the uh, support of the European Commission also uh, as a, a contribution to the dialogue in the region, as uh, confirmed by the last ministerial Euro-Mediterranean Energy uh, Declaration last June, which have called also to have such a vision and uh, how it would like, uh, look like in order to uh, discuss among it. So, first results. Here you see uh, the prospects for the decarbonized scenario by 2050 in the North Mediterranean region and in the South. You also see the line is the CO2 emissions. To achieve a net zero future, carbon future by 2050, total Mediterranean energy demand will need to be reduced by a quarter from current level, a challenging feat when considering that we are expecting to have more 130 million people in the South Mediterranean region. And this would be coupled with the doubling of GDP prospects over the same horizon. Over the three past decades, energy demand increased by 43%, and under current trends, it would increase by 31% in 
even including unconditional, unconditional and disease targets to 2050. The situation is quite contrasted across the two shores of the Mediterranean, with an already declining energy demand in the north, where energy efficiency measures have started already to be enforced, coupled with falling population trends, while in the south, energy demand has been soaring and population and economic growth, growth thriving. To reach carbon neutrality by 2050 in the north, Mediterranean energy demand will need to be reduced by a further 41%, while increase in demand in the south should be capped under 2% to 2050 from current levels. It is not just the level of demand that needs to be brought down, but also the fuel mix that needs to improve drastically. At present, fossil fuels account for 76% for the energy mix, 65% in the north and 92% in the south. Renewables, although fast increasing, stat stand at only 12% of the total Mediterranean energy demand, and while that share reaches 15% in the north, it is barely attaining 8% of total energy demand in the south. In 2030, even if all NDCs are reached, fossil fuels will still account for 71% of the mix, 80% in the south alone, due to the inertia of transport sector, and industry demand that cannot be hastily displaced. In a near zero carbon future, renewables will need to step up to reach 57% of the total mix. By 2050, around 60% in the north and 55% in the south. By 2050, the energy mix will need to be 57% renewables, 17% nuclear, and 26% fossil, and 23% gas alone, so most of the hydrocarbons fossil will be gas. The change in the mix and the decrease in energy demand overall will be driven substantially by the electrification of most end uses, with electricity accounting for 66%, 56% of total final consumption by 2050, compared to 22% currently. Energy efficiency and renewables will account for the bulk of the energy-related carbon emission reduction, with energy efficiency expected to account for 46% carbon reduction and renewables for 44%. However, to reach full decarbonization, green gases, mainly hydrogen and biomethane, will be pivotal and carbon capture technologies will also play a vital role, especially in the industry sector. So, how much it would cost? The story. Scaling up the energy transition in the Mediterranean in line with a net zero emissions target will be costly. To reach carbon neutrality in 2050, the investment needed would exceed 6,700 billion euros a near 7 trillion ticket to achieve climate goals and energy security in the region. Half of the investments will be needed in the South Mediterranean region alone. The Mediterranean would need around 2 billion, 2,000 billion euros in investment between today, 2022, and 2030 to meet their NDCs targets. Three quarters of these investments will need to be deployed in the 2030-2050 period. Half of the required investment will not target directly energy production, but rather energy saving to fuel energy efficiency measures. The power sector will account for nearly 40% of the required investment. Looking at the direct energy investments, including energy efficiency investments, renewables will account for 70% of total investment needs and nuclear for 11%. Thus, a total of 81% of its investments will go to non-carbonated energy supply. The remaining 19% of fossil fuels will be mainly for gas. Upstream, midstream, and the refurbishment of gas plants with more efficient utilities as gas is the cleanest fuel among hydrocarbons. Although the 20, 200 billion, 240 billion euros a year needed to fuel the transition may seem daunting, it is not just the cost of energy and efficiency that needs to be taken into account to get the real picture. 
the cost of inaction would make a real mark on the Mediterranean's economy and population. Climate shocks could shrink economies, increase energy bills, reduce export revenues, increase poverty, and decrease real wages, not to mention the severe impacts on agriculture, food, and water. If the rest of the world decarbonizes and the Mediterranean does not, the cost of inaction would be even worsen. International private fundings are essential to meet these large investment needs. However, various barriers in the South countries, especially in terms of policies, continue to prevent international investors from becoming more engaged in the South renewable energy sectors. Against this backdrop, further support is required so that the South Mediterranean countries can meet their energy demands in a sustainable way to the benefit not only for the so of the South, but also the North. Supporting sustainable energy development would indeed imply opening up new business opportunities for the whole Euro Mediterranean energy companies to operate in a rapidly growing market and promoting the export of European and renewable energy technologies. This is already notably the case for wind power, the sector in which the South currently relies on important European technology. This would allow to promote a more rapid economic development in the South, which is a key prerequisite for expanding the region's economic and trade relations with the North, with the positive geopolitical repercussions it would entail. Moreover, this would guarantee the stability of future gas exports from the South to Europe by allowing these countries to meet their growing electricity demand with renewables instead of gas. Freeing gas for exports will enhance European Union's energy security of supply, thus increasing the stability and security of the whole region. So we need to foster cooperation to more closely co work together, and this is only a win-win solution for a better future energy and climate in the Mediterranean region. Thank you. So after this uh, uh, presentation of uh, how the future would look like and how much money would be required in order to fuel uh, decarbonizing the Mediterranean, I'm very pleased to uh, give the floor to Kamel Benasser, who will be moderating the session. So Kamel is a former minister uh, in uh, Tunisia for uh, energy, industry, and mine, and he's uh, very close to what we are doing because he was acting and he is acting as the chairman of uh, the advisory board that drafted the Euromed declaration, ministerial declaration, and he's also the chairman of the advisory board for MEP. So what, all what is uh, well done is thanks to him. All what is not well done is uh, our fault. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I leave you the floor in order to thank you very much for accepting to moderate this session. And I leave you the floor to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Huda. And thank you, Graminos, for a great introdu introduction. So basically, Huda, you are telling us we need $6.7 trillion between now and 2050. So if we annualize that, it's about what? 250, about 250 billion euros per year. So let's follow up from the OME side because OME is the champion for scenarios. And what are the challenges, uh, Matteo, that you see for financing these needs for the energy industry around the Mediterranean, 250 billion euros per year. And, how, what, and the second question, because you have a bonus one, is how, what role can OME play in order to facilitate some of these uh, processes in terms of financing and uh, capacity building? Thank you, Kamel, for this uh, interesting question and to have the opportunity to introduce some, uh, some view that uh, OME and uh, the Financial Committee have uh, about uh, the, the region. I think that today we have uh, a unique chance to reshape the energy system in an area where all the ingre ingredients are there. What I mean? Uh, the Mediterranean area have the opportunity to exploit renewable energy, 
but they have also hydrocarbon sources available that have to be valorized and not to be waste. Second, there will be an economic growth, for sure, because there will be a demographic growth. So it's, we cannot think about the demographic growth without have an economic development. And uh, in a such a way, the investment will be not a risk, will be an opportunity to reshape something that could become, in the future, a model. Sometime I heard about risk, the risk to be late, eh? to not have, not have the opportunity to stay at the same level. I think the Mediterranean countries have to be considered just one unique, let's say, union. And they have to benefit from north to the south. North have the, gr the ground and the frame that could help the south to exploit the development. But only if there is a, a straightforward cooperation in the next month and the next years, we can achieve this target. Uh, what I, I see is that we have to use the energy that is located in the area in order to boost the renewable. Does it make any sense that this energy flow away from the Mediterranean Sea has to be used in order to push new investment. About uh, how to attract investment, I think the, the first point is that we have to find a frame that is well known and is, is recognized by not only public entity, but also by private company. And in Europe, this is, exists already. We have to share and make this possible in the other area. Uh, if I want to, to see really a risk, uh, and is the risk that we have to avoid in order to attract the investment, is in the future, we have to benefit from uh, distributed energy that will be not more centralized. This requires, in any case, planning. It requires to cooperate, but we have to avoid isolation. This is my point of view. So, uh, bu building on that, the OME is doing this fantastic job that Huda has been uh, presenting. So, how can, what kind of support would OME need going in the future to even elaborate further those scenarios? Yes, I mean, OME have the capability and the ability to provide a scenario to assess new constraints and to help in the design of the new energy system shape. But in order to make this real, as I anticipated before, I think it's necessary a back-to-back -back cooperation between exi already existing bodies. So not only from the industrial side, but also from the financial side. So I think it's the right moment to make it doable and effective. I think it's the moment to design targets is completed. Now is the moment to implement, but it, to implement, you have to design. And I think OME could help to design in a strength cooperation with financial entities. Thank you very much, Matteo. So the people who would do it in the ground are the energy companies. And uh, Eduardo, you represent ENI and you represent OMC as well. So you have two hats, I guess. And uh, so from a, a practical side, we saw a transformation of ENI over the last two decades into a very different structure, very different strategy. So where do you see ENI? I will go back to OMC later on, the role of OMC. But let's start with ENI and the role that uh, ENI will play in this energy transition. We have seen you doing amazing things in Egypt in fast tracking development of gas. So how can we fast track the energy transition in the region based on your experience? Okay, thank you, uh, Kamel. Uh, and thank you for inviting me uh, representing OMC Energy Conference. 
uh, and as OMC Metallurgy Thompson's, we have a very privileged observatory on uh, uh, the industry sector, not only in I, but the whole industry sectors. We can observe this uh, transition in the last three decades, as for three decades, uh, we uh, organize events uh, on, uh, on the energies, hosting industries, uh, with the same goal. We started 30 years ago discussing on how to provide clean, affordable, and secure energies. We continue today, for sure, embracing, like uh, you and I, all the, all the possible solutions in our portfolio. So we have absolutely to uh, uh, try to uh, embrace any possible solution. And uh, moreover, uh, our, let me say, privilege of servity gave us that the partnerships uh, are absolutely essential for, uh, for the transition. So integrating marketing, integrating uh, markets uh, among all the Mediterranean countries are really the turning point. Uh, of the transitions. We have stressed during these days in these panels uh, the importance of this, uh, of this role. Um, during these days we debate about the uh, Mediterranean cooperations and partnerships that emerge clearly. Uh, for example, uh, Mediterranean, I for sure, the, um, represent a unique uh, region uh, for uh, uh, become a, a sort of backbone, uh, a natural gas hub, and so is the backbone for the security of Europe, integrating uh, north and south, but on top, in order to provide uh, uh, the carbonized solution, we can, and we demonstrate, uh, hosting a panel on CCUS, while these technologies can help uh, to provide the carbonized solution for the industry in the short term, but represent a, a unique opportunity also for the southern shore of the Mediterranean to become a carbon removal hub, providing new opportunity of growth and new opportunity investment. Uh, we debate about renewables. Renewable has a great potential, even uh, in, uh, unless today there is uh, very few uh, capacity installed, but right now in this moment, improving renewable in the southern shore of the Mediterranean means uh, freeing some gas uh, to be exported. And so, uh, and so investing in renewables means also acting on the security of gas production at the med level. So alliances is for sure crucial uh, at, at that moment. And we think that uh, working on, on, uh, uh, on the alliances is really uh, the point, the stressing point. We have to move uh, towards a two-way integrated uh, alliances in which uh, we go behind the mere uh, energy sphere, trying to uh, generate partnership also in innovation, technologies, uh, energy efficiency, all the potential leverages between the north and the south, uh, for sure it's, it's a difficult task, eh? but this uh, kind of partnership and using all the potential technologies available generate a huge amount of potential opportunities and at the same time uh, occasion of, let's say, investment. So, so you are seeing a transformation of the OMC conference from what it was before, which was mostly offshore oil and gas into uh, covering all of the energy sector, all the sectors of the energy transition. That's the, the future. Now, moving to where the money is, and I think I have on my left FJ, I hope I'm pronouncing your na name right. You're in charge of strategy and partnerships. I think it's a new created position at the EIB uh, looking at opportunities outside of the European Union. So how do you see, what kind of role do you see the EIB play in these uh, scenarios that uh, Huda has been presented? Uh, thank you for giving me the floor and uh, for inviting me to this distinguished panel and this beautiful pavilion. 
It's a pleasure to be here and to re reply to your question related to EIB's role. Um, I'd like to start by saying that um, we operate both inside the EU and outside the EU, so on both shores of the Mediterranean, and we see our role primarily as climate, climate financier. Um, we have been pioneering uh, on green bonds and also part, obviously, uh, of being part of the target setting that uh, you have mentioned and which is obviously very important if we want to move ahead. We see um, the next 10 years as a critical decade uh, where we have set very ambition, ambitious goals for ourselves. Um, for instance, we have set ourselves the goal to, f to finance um, a minimum of 50% of all of our activities should you know, support climate action. Uh, and the goal was set to f uh, until 2025, but we have actually already reached it last year. So we are very proud of this achievement, and this also shows that it can be done, and it can be actually done rather fast if there is a real commitment to do so. Um, we are also fully aligned with the Paris uh, Agreement. We're the, the first MDB to have fully aligned the Paris Agreement. Um, so climate is in everything we do. And obviously it also helps us to be credible when emitting green bonds, because otherwise you, know, you, you lose this credibility in the market. Um, so um, I, now turning perhaps, no, I mean, you, you asked also, I think, on what concretely we, we, we are doing. So it has been man mentioned, we need to unlock more energy efficiency. We need to decarbonize the energy supply. We need to support innovative uh, technologies um, and to, we need to secure an enabling infrastructure. Um, turning to, to the MED, because this obviously is true for, for all the regions, uh, you, you have med mentioned the, the stress the region is, is under. Um, and, uh, and on top of what you have mentioned, we also know that there is that the fiscal space is limited. So if we lend, uh, you know, we need a borrower who has the capacity to take on the loans. Uh, the, the good news is that uh, IFIs, including EIB, uh, have uh, the possibility to offer financing as a, at a relatively low cost. Um, and also combined with technical expertise, which is much needed if you want to move to uh, alternative sources of energy. Um, so uh, this, I think, is an important uh, uh, matter. And um, uh, on top of it, what is also needed is uh, project preparation, uh, technical assistance, uh, you know, offering uh, blending, blended instruments, uh, and as we have mentioned, risk as well, uh, ri risk sharing instruments, because there is still a perceived risk. And I think also uh, in, in building strong partnerships, we can also help to de-risk our investments. Um, so I would leave it here for the time being, and I'm happy to take further questions. Thank you very much for your great point. So you talked about the, uh, the cost of financing, and uh, it's an extremely important point for the region. The second one is uh, related to pricing carbon in the region. And we're starting to see in the region uh, countries talking about uh, tools to price carbon. Uh, do you see EIB play a role in this emission trading? So far EIB has to my knowledge, not uh, okay. played played a role. Um, I mean, we obviously follow the EU policies, um, so we are bound and and we believe that this is the right way to go by by setting uh, the the example. Um, so you know everything that is possible under the EU taxonomy, we we will support. Okay. And if I come to you with a project with uh, CO2 capture and storage, would you? Accept it? I actually forgot to mention a very important point which relates to our energy lending policy yeah. uh, and also to what we heard previously. So, uh, when we decided that we wanted to become the, the EU bank, 
Um, we also took the decision to phase out fossil fuel financing. We have actually never financed nuclear. So um, w under these criteria, you know, we, we operate. So okay. th these are the, the criteria. Um, I would also like to add, since you mentioned uh, EIB Global and the creation of this new uh, directorate at the EIB, uh, that it's not just about climate action, but it's also about supporting development and also to make sure that the energy transition is a just transi transition. Okay. So I would like to add this uh, to the debate because we cannot pretend that this you know, will leave the, the people, the populations uh, that work in, um, let's say, uh, traditional uh, energy sectors unaffected. Okay, thank you very much, FJ, and uh, I think it's a very good segue to uh, our next uh, speaker, Monsieur Vincent Chauvet, uh, who is representing the, the regions. And uh, I, by the way, I found out that we were in the same uh, lycée in Louis Le Grand, but a few years uh, difference. And so, from your experience, and talking about just transition, uh, and leaving no one left, I mean, behind, how can we have the experience from the north uh, being translated to other countries around the region? Thank you very much for inviting me and the uh, souvenirs from uh, high school in Paris. Um, I am mayor of Autun, which is a city in Burgundy, not exactly in the Mediterranean, um, but we, uh, I'm a member of the European Committee of the Regions, and thank you for inviting us. It's the um, assembly of locally uh, elected politicians, so at the regional level, departmental level, and mayors also mostly. And uh, we represent all kinds of political families at all levels of government, uh, sub-national, and I'm, I'm a liberal democrat for the centrist group. And what we uh, have been doing for the past 12 years now, uh, and which is not very well known, but uh, needs to to to, to to, to be known, maybe uh, some of you know already, is Arlem. Arlem is, a, is, a, is also a, a parliament, a parliament of, of local politicians uh, for um, the Mediterranean and European Union. And Egypt, for instance, is part of Arlem. Um, and, and it's the forum uh, to, to discuss and to exchange best practices um, uh, from mayors to mayors, uh, from uh, regional governors to regional governors. Um, and uh, it has had some success and we think at the European Committee of the Regions that sub-national diplomacy uh, is important, not only best practices but also we think that we lack ambition at the national level, that climate, ne climate negotiations are, are, are kind of blocked, that we are on the wrong way uh, or we are not on the, on the way to, to Paris and to, uh, uh, to, uh, to limit CO2 emissions. And that's now ambitions lies on both sides of the Mediterranean uh, uh, at the local level in the mayors and in the regions. And we want to be proactive and, and push forward our governments because we, some of us were in government, some of us will be maybe in government, uh, but to, to, uh, to push the national governments to, um, to, uh, to go faster. And, and, and now I I it's easy, I was, I was uh, impressed by the, the the number of 6.7 billion euros necessary. That's the cost of acting, but we know now, especially in the north of the Mediterranean, the cost of non-action. Non and for me, for my city, 15,000 inhabitants, it's 1 million euros more this year than last year to uh, hit the schools, uh, the swimming pool, and public buildings, just this. So uh, we, we know um, uh, what we have to do. Um, and we have plans and uh, you said now let's go from designing to implementing and it's going to be the private energy sector. I, 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 I tend to disagree a little bit. I like a lot the Italian model where at the regional level, at the regional level you have uh, public owned companies that are owned by the regions and that produce renewable energies and that produce energies that are integrated companies. Every every um, every Mediterranean country has a different system for uh, uh, producing uh, energy, uh, but very often, and I think more and more, 
the public sector directly will be producing energy. And just to give you an example as of this, uh, an example that is also in the favor of social justice and jobs locally produced uh, is, is uh, woods. We underuse woods uh, in, in some parts of Europe. And woods can be uh, can be used also uh, for central heating, and so we we, we are developing this a lot uh, in in my region and in France in general, where we uh, use uh, uh, wood so biomass uh, uh, to uh, uh, so it gives jobs to to uh, uh, not skilled workers, and then we eat and we eat for the the social housing uh, providing uh, providing uh, uh, um, cheap uh, energy and cheap heats for also. Uh, the local population. So this is the kind of examples that we can share, uh, and this is the kind of examples we work on at the European Committee of the Regions in strong partnership with the Parliament and the European Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. And, and the current crisis is showing that actually energy poverty is a problem not of the South only, it's a problem also in the North. Uh, and we all need to, uh, to make sure we don't leave anyone behind. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, pass the floor to our chairman. And uh, Mr. Lapo Pistelli, uh, excuse me? Okay, for a question, if you want to ask a question. Okay, please go ahead. Be before giving any unforeseen conclusion, I would like to, to raise a question to Effie Schmidt. Uh, because um, the rationale is the following. The finance for development and transition is a very high-speed moving environment, you know. And I remember that when we uh, had our last physical assembly of OME in Cairo, January 2020, so we were one month before the COVID broke out, we received a presentation from the IB explaining to the audience the new lending criteria, 2020. And I remember that those lending criteria were the compromise, uh, as a European I knew some details of a conversation happened in Brussels, between a more radical approach uh, aiming at transforming EIB in a pure green bank, that's it, and a compromise that came after a debate. And so the new lending criteria were the physical and plastic representation of that kind of debate. Now, my, my, uh, my question is, because in this last two years, we experienced, first of all, the COVID, then the, the big push for the uh, Fit for 55 and the uh, stimulus package, not only in Europe, but also in, uh, in the US. Some countries, more in Africa, were lagging behind because they, they were lacking such a, a public stimulus package. But then we, we are also, and then there was the debate in the EU uh, sphere about taxonomy. We see how uh, matching with investors' and, uh, investors' questions, the ESG amount of, uh, of available money is increasing. Okay, taking all this into consideration, but now, uh, being challenged from the monster of inflation on the one hand and the monster of inflation is biting the wallet, the public wallet and on the other hand this realignment about energy crunch, energy security of supply do you see any possibility for the EIB to, I, I wouldn't say to rethink but to realign the conversation about the lending criteria to this new reality which is evolving so fast The answer, as of today, is definitely not. No backtracking. We remain firmly committed to the targets we have set and also to the energy lending policy as it stands. Uh, we do believe that it, it's needed more than ever. Uh, we feel that we are absolutely doing the right thing. Um, and we we see that it can influence markets uh, and we also think that investments will in any case happen so let's make sure they happen in the right way 
So it's really about redirecting investments and also stepping up the efforts. Uh, it's also about possibly crowding in the private sector as much as possible. And this can be notably done by the development of new technologies, which is, I think, a great opportunity. Um, so we are firmly, we firmly believe that we are doing the right thing and hopefully, you know, together we can get it done in the right way. Um, I, I like very much what you said about green and sustainable um, transition. I think, you know, it has to be sustainable. It's not just about green. Uh, we also we often think, you know, it's just about climate, but it's sustainable development, which, which we want to achieve together. And I think we have provided very good examples of, you know, what can be done. Uh, and it's really about stepping up uh, those, those efforts. Um, I mean, now we are in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian government has, has launched the, the nexus on um, water, food and energy. I think we need to think in this holistic way. Uh, transport was mentioned, sustainable transport. It's all linked, it's all inter interlinked. Agriculture, um, so let's try to have, you know, this holistic approach and to move into, s into this uh, direction. Um, I mean, we are there to provide the, the infrastructure. Um, it's also, I think, about um, if we, we the interconnection interconnections were, were, were mentioned, um, uh, we can use pipelines differently. It, it mustn't mean that we have to build something totally new. So it's just about, you know, having the courage to address things differently. Uh, but of course, it's, it's a big challenge, and, and, but we, we need to, you know, live up to it together. Thank you very much. So, Lapo, uh, you want to conclude, or we can have another question? So, please. Have questions or okay. else. So, so, I want to have a, a follow up question uh, following on what Efshe just said. So, one of the biggest use of energy is in the transport sector and from urban environments. How can we, as uh, a society, help develop a sustainable transport system in the, si in the south? Because that's one of the big differentiators in terms of efficiency of use of energy. How can we learn from the north, and talking to uh, Vincent, uh, on the transport and urban infrastructure that can be helping the south? So. Um, one thing first is, is uh, that we struggle with the same problem with transportation in the north and in the south and we have to decarbonize fast. But what I think we're doing uh, that can be transposed uh, in the south and it, it's just being done now is um, a real reflection about urbanization and about stopping uh, artificialization, artificialization of lands and ag uh, agricultural land and also having uh, town planning uh, that is uh, more responsible because if you build uh, houses very far away uh, in the north or in the south you will have difficulties which reach them with the uh, transportation so right now for instance france is doing the zero artificialization of soil which is very very hard to achieve even with a decreasing population or in a stable population and then the European Union is working on uh, renaturation of soil, meaning you have artificialized land that you will give back to nature. So the, 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 um, the solution lies not only on technology and, and, and designing transportation networks, but also on designing the city uh, of tomorrow and the use of land, I think. Okay, thank you very much. So with uh, those great words, I'm going to pass on the floor to uh, Mr. Lapo Pistelli. Uh, who is uh, the director of public affairs with ENI, and he has he's also the chairman of OME, and he has many other hats. So I want I think we will finish the session talking about all those hats. So Lapo, from what you have heard, what are your final thoughts? Thank you, Camille. Too many hats, a few hair. I'm sorry, but said that. Okay, thank you very much because the conversation was quite uh, interesting, exciting, also because 
Kamel, you, you have been leading the conversation with very punching questions and in a very unconventional way. I like it. I appreciate it. And thank you to Gramenos and Huda for, for their remarks and the big data that Huda provided to our conversation. My few comments. Um, I, I noticed just before starting this, uh, this event that uh, the, I would say the, the headline uh, of our event are mirroring the, the famous five uh, questions of, uh, for the journalist, uh, who, when, where. There's only a, a, a missing uh, double, double, double W, which is why. So why is the only question we don't need to answer. We know why we have to do it, okay? But if I, if I have to take some of your points and trying to summarize the other four questions, who, when, where, and how, who? Okay, it seems very clear, even from this conversation, that, first of all, the companies are uh, players, key players of this transformation. Not only because of the technology, but technology is the, is the key basis, but also because they have, uh, especially the biggest one, they have a, a portfolio and a budget, and they are, I would say, deeply involved in this, in this uh, rationale Namely, uh, energy has always been a history of innovation. And so you innovate because you spend, you invest in research. You uh, develop the energy of today, meanwhile you are studying and developing and exploring the energy of tomorrow. This has always been like that, okay? Um, and I think that this is useful. Uh, forgive me if sometimes I'm showing some pieces of my dinosaur skin because Annie is also producing traditional energy, oil and gas, because the big ones, um, the public sector, the political debate needs the big ones, also because the revenues, the profit coming from the traditional core industry is the non-public, private wallet that is financing the transformation. So if you cut it out, you, you, you will not have any private investment on research on energy. So we are, a pl we are a player of the transformation because we are spending money. If I have to talk with uh, my any head and not with the OME head, we have spent six billions in the last five years in research in a wide spectrum of technologies. Uh, sometimes our proprietary patents of the traditional core energy, but we are also exploring not, not only the fusion, Commonwealth fusion system, but also the energy from marine uh, energy and sea waves. A, a number of a number of items we will see um, we are doing that because as I as I, as I said history has always been an, a story of innovation energy but also because the big shift in the conversation is that we care at the same time about our shareholders and about our stakeholders and the stakeholders not necessarily are the shareholders and so we have a public added value in giving and in profiling what we are doing in the, in the public conversation. Then, uh, this is one single aspect of the question that I was raising to, to Effie, it's clear that it's not only about the private sector, it's about the public sector. And when I mean public sector, I mean institutional, inter international uh, financial institution and, and then the, all the private sector. And uh, this second player gives me the, I would say, the trigger to say uh, how, or maybe this is a piece of a how, because what I think, and this is connect also to when, because it's very easy to, say, to reply to the question when by saying now, we have to do it now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, now. But what is uh, needed, highly needed, I guess, today, realigning the conversation on affordability, uh, transition, security, is to have in mind a very precise timeline where you have some low-hanging fruits that need to be picked immediately, tomorrow. That is something that it's important to put in the conversation about energy, but we have to be uh, aware that some of the outcome of, those, of that kind of vector and sources will be available for the mass market, not tomorrow, but in a decade to come. And then you need to keep going with the remote, I would say, investment 
about infrastructures and I would say energy public goods which are not available for the single private player but needs to be there and the role of the public sector is essentially uh, the one that the private sector couldn't pay, couldn't play. So, uh, precise timeline, low-hanging fruit, technology which are mature today, which will be mature at the end of this decade, which will be needed in the 30s. I would like to remind to all of you, to all of us, uh, that when the IEA every year uh, publishes his uh, technology index, they took into consideration more than 300 different technology, uh, and every year there's a preamble in the, in the, in the report that says, look, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of these technologies are not available at the moment, but we know that we have to get there. So we know that we have to invest in order to be ready when the time will be mature enough. And uh, finally, where uh, north and south? This is something really interesting that I guess uh, this COP here in, 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 in Sharm can really uh, boost. Because my impression, I mean, I'm talking very, not in Chatham House because we're on air and so on, but that's my personal impression. If I have to capture uh, the sense, the feeling of the conversation that happened last year in Glasgow, was basically a Euro-American conversation with a precise target to onboard Russia, India and China, and with the south of the world looking at the conversation. I will be very blunt in that. What I see as a possibility here in Cairo and next year in Abu Dhabi is to onboard the south of the world, which eventually would remain as a guest of the conversation. And we know that either in terms of access to energy, secure energy, affordable energy, and the new vector and sources of renewable is, is a key player, is a key player. So I do believe that it's so important to onboard either the north or the south. Um, I'll, 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 I'll uh, shut up by saying, first of all, that I would like to really thank all of you for being here and saying that, as I, as I was saying in a previous event, I like the call to action that you can read on all of the wall of this COP, which is together for implementation. So the big thing now is not only to announce new targets, is to go for implementation. Because one year is so short, you can't revise the targets every year. You need to uh, understand what you have done, who is lagging behind, what you can do to help those who are lagging behind, and in which way. So this is the real, I mean, maybe as a company man now, I'm so, well, I would say, connected to the uh, verification of your results, and not, on, not, not all in terms of announcement, but in terms of what you have done, what you have achieved. And so what we need the most are political engineers. We, we have a lot of engineers in energy, but we need uh, uh, political engineers but because what we need to do is to connect all these dots. Who, when, where, how. The pieces of the jigsaw are there. We, we all see them. The big need and the big challenge is how to connect them in an effective way. So that said, thank you to all for attending. Thank you very much, uh, Lapo. I just, uh, you, you made a, a fantastic uh, summary. Uh, I wanted to add a couple of points. If we look at what has happened since COP21 in Paris, three of the seven COPs, including the one next year in Abu Dhabi, are in the MENA region. So that is three out of seven. That is 40%. So that means that this region is deeply concerned and deeply involved in the transformation. You also said that we are seeing here a bigger implication of the South. We're also seeing a bigger implication of the industry. And with what we have seen with the decarbonization day that was organized for the first time, we are looking at implying, uh, I mean, involving every single party in the solution. And I think this is a great, great transformation that we should see going on into the future. So thank you very much to our great uh, panelists. Thank you to our speakers. And thank you for a great concluding remarks. Thank you so much.